your Bible with me tonight to the book of Genesis chapter 42. We're going to finish Genesis 42 and go through 43 as well as we look at an overview of these two chapters. But we're learning more and more on a weekly basis as we look at the life of Joseph regarding the providence of God. What is the providence of God? Today, uh, we have to understand that. Today, we have to realize that. We have to trust God in that. In fact, we titled the message tonight on the path of providence. If someone asks you, where are you at right now? Well, you can respond, I'm on the path of providence. I am on the path of God's care for my life. I am on the path where God knows all of the answers already. I am on that path where God is overseeing every event of my life, where my life is in his hands. That is the path of providence. And today know that your life is in God's hands. And when we realize that God is in control of every area of your life, notice what begins to happen. You begin to trust him in everything. When you realize you are just a part of God's plan, then you trust him in every situation, every area of your life. You're, you're not afraid. You're not worried. You're trusting in the Lord. You may think, well, I, I'm not where I should be, but you're exactly where God wants you to be. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. And you know what providence teaches us? The fear of God. Providence reminds us that we must walk in humility. It reminds us in every circumstance, instead of being self-sufficient or independent or hard-hearted or cold inside, to trust in God. Because so easily we can become independent. We can want to fight to have our way. Strive, try, force things. Kick against what God is doing. Remember, your life is in God's hands. And if your life is in God's hands, then that's the safest place that it can be. Can you say amen to that? That is the safest place your life can be. Now, the danger is when you try to take your life into your own hands, and when you say because of mistreatment, because of unjust behavior towards me, I, I want to get even. I, I want to defend myself. I want to retaliate. That's a very dangerous place to be in as a believer. Whenever you want to defend yourself, whenever you try to defend yourself, notice God will allow you to defend yourself. Whenever you try to get even, notice what you're doing. You're just going down to the level of that person that hurt you. You know what integrity means? Integrity means that you don't get even. You leave that to the Lord. And on the path of providence, notice what Joseph is learning. He's learning two things, to trust God and to forgive others who hurt him. And I want you to remind yourself of that. Maybe write it down tonight. Trust God and forgive those who hurt you. Don't hold on to that bitterness or, re or resentment. Don't become hard in your heart. God can't use you if you're bitter. Notice that. And you see that through the life of Joseph, God had a purpose for Joseph's life, but he had a deal with Joseph first. And he, had a, he allowed Joseph to go through these tests to develop his character for the place that he had already prepared for him. God prepared the place, but first he had to prepare the person. That's how God does things. And he had allowed Joseph to take a few tests, the same type of test that he'll allow you to go through as well. In fact, the first test that he allowed Joseph to go through was the pride test. The pride test. What happened? He received these dreams from the Lord. He, st he started telling the dreams to his brothers before the time. Hey, guess what, guys? I had a dream, and you were all bowing down to me. <laughs> he was learning that he needed to humble himself. He, he was taking the pride test. Maybe God is having you take that test right now. And before he uses you to the greater capacity at that next season, he needs you to learn something about humility. Or what about the purity test? Where he was tempted there with Potiphar's wife, she tempted him, lie with me several times. 
God took him through that home to teach him about purity. And then after, as he was unjustly thrown into prison, he took the prison test. You know what the prison test looks like? When you are unjustly treated. When you didn't deserve it and it still happened. When you were falsely accused when you were mistreated by other people that were supposed to love you, how did you respond? He was taking that test in prison. But now there in chapter 42 and 43, he he takes another test. It's the pardon test. It is where he's learning to forgive the people who wronged him. And God has to have him take that test. The more he uses Joseph. In fact, I want to ask you this. Would you forgive the people who did you wrong? Or are you still talking about it then? You know how you learn if you truly forgive them? Are you praying that God blesses them? (laughs) Are you praying that God blesses them? If you can't pray that prayer from the heart, then you haven't forgiven them yet. Or are you holding on to it? Are you upset, frustrated, angry? God can't bless you if you're walking around with an angry heart at other people. And here, there's a, it's a time of testing now in, in chapter 42 of Genesis. And in, in fact, he, he is reuniting with those people that hurt him. He, he's going to see them again. What happens when you see that person that, that hurt you in the past? Have you ever come to terms or maybe bumped into someone that hurt you in the past? What, what happened? You maybe freeze up. <laughs> You maybe want to go the other way. You don't want to see them. You don't want to hear their name. You hear their name. It's something provokes in you. Something triggers you in your flesh. Well, Joseph is about to meet those brothers of his who unjustly sold him, mistreated him, and did him wrong and hurt him. And you know what he does? He leaves room for repentance. When you meet up with those people, leave room for the Holy Spirit to work. Don't try to force anything. Leave room for repentance because true forgiveness requires true repentance. And if there's going to be forgiveness, if there's going to be reconciliation, you know what Joseph does? He gives room for his brothers to hear from God and God to work in their hearts. You want to know why the reason people don't repent is because They haven't realized their own sin because they fail to realize that they have sin. In fact, they usually think everyone else is the problem, not me. You can't repent that way. Repentance takes an acknowledgement and awareness of an awakened conscience that realizes I have sin, therefore I need to repent and ask for forgiveness. He was leaving room so that his brothers were aware of their own sin sin, an awakened conscience happened there in their brother's lives. You see that in Ephesians 4.19, it would speak about the Lord who had given those people up who were past feeling. You know what past feeling means? Your heart is so hard, you no longer feel the conviction. Well, his brothers began to feel conviction. Finally, they realized that what they had done was wrong. Today, I pray that maybe tonight the Lord would speak to us and if we have sinned against someone, we have sinned against God, that we would realize tonight God would awaken our conscience of our own personal sin. That we wouldn't point the finger at other people. We're so good at that. And what does the saying say? You point one finger, what happens? Three are pointing back at you. (laughs) Why don't you stand with me as we look at Genesis 42? We'll read God's word together tonight. We'll begin there in verse 28. And I'll read that even verse. You read the odd verses out loud together. Genesis 42, 28. So he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done to us? The man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us, and he took us for spies of the country. We 
We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more. And the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. And bring your younger brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men, and I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. And Jacob their father said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. But he said, My son shall not go down, for his brother is dead, and he's left alone. If any calamities should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. As, Lord, we are waiting to hear and receive from you tonight, Lord, speak for your servants are listening. And, Lord, speak to us, awaken our conscience to our own sin. Lord, teach us to trust you and to forgive. And so we pray this all in Jesus' name, and together we would say, Amen. You may be seated. You saw there in verse 28 where we read is the account of the brothers returning back to the land of Canaan after one has looked into his sack and seen that his money has been returned. Joseph had returned their money, each of them. And it says there in verse 28 that their hearts failed them. They were, they were afraid. They were convicted now. They knew that what they had done was wrong. God is speaking to them regarding their past. And it would say there that not only did their hearts fail them, they were terrified. They were afraid. In fact, notice there next to the word afraid, you can put the words fear of God. That was the fear that they had. They had fear of God. And you know that this fear was the fear of God because of what they said next. They said, what is this that God has done to us? Do you see the Holy Spirit speaks to us even when we know that we have wronged or sin, where God is speaking to them there. And their consciousness is awakened that it's not only someone else's fault. This is our fault. This is our sin. They have godly fear. They're trembling and they respond this way. What has God done to us? That, that's a guilty conscience. It always says that. What is this? What is this that God has done to us? But you know, when you go to the Lord for forgiveness and you ask him for mercy and for grace, instead of a guilty conscience, you have a pure conscience. And your response is different in life. Instead of saying, what has God done to us? You start saying, what has God done for us? Notice, you, you think about, you realize, you recognize, look what God has done for us. Now, what's interesting about this verse in verse 28 is that Joseph did this for his brothers, having returned their money before they were reconciled to him, before they repented, before they asked for forgiveness. Yet he loved them. He showed grace. He showed care for them. He gave them what they needed, and they didn't even know it. There they were on their way back to Canaan, and they're already receiving the goodness of Joseph. They're already recognizing and learning of the care of their brother, not knowing that he was doing that for them. In that same way, notice as we look at the portraits of Christ there through the life of Joseph, is that Jesus also gives us unexpected blessings. Do you remember before you were reconciled to him? Before you had asked for forgiveness? Sometimes those Blessings were obvious, and sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they were up front where you can see this is God. Other times they were more subtle and hidden, and you discovered them later. When you look back at your life, you say, that was God in that point in my life. 
I, I was lost. I, I was a sinner. I had not asked for forgiveness, yet God still was taking care of me even before I was reconciled to him. And there you see the goodness of Joseph as he loves his brothers, as he patiently waits for God to deal with them. You know what Joseph is doing? He's showing us the high road here of forgiveness and compassion. This is how he's treating those who mistreated him. What does he do? He gives them gifts. <laughs> Imagine someone asks you, you know that person that mistreated you? Instead of trying to get even, why don't you go give them a gift? What would you do? You say, you know what? I need to pray a little bit more about that. <laughs> but Joseph is caring for them. Joseph is now showing goodness and love and compassion and forgiveness. He's not bitter. He's not holding a grudge from the past. He, he's moving forward. And I pray that we would be like Joseph. We would not hold a grudge from the past. We would move on, move forward. Don't get bitter. Don't, don't get even like the world. You know who gets even? The world gets even. You know what tries to get back at people? The world tries to get back at people. That's not what a Christian should do. How, how can you say you're blameless or you're hearing from God if you're going to do that? In Rome, Proverbs 20, verse 22, would you write this down tonight? Proverbs 20, 22. Notice what Solomon tells us. Don't say, don't say this. I will get even for this is wrong. It's clear in his word. Don't say, because they did this to me, now I'm going to do this to them. I'm going to teach them a lesson. Proverbs 20, 22. Don't say, I will get even for this is wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. What should you do? Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. Or Romans 12, 14. Also a verse that you can know tonight. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse. What does that mean? Pray for them. Bless them. Those that are persecuting you, don't curse them. Don't speak bad about them. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, Romans 12. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, it, it's not up to you. It's not your responsibility. You're out of line when you think you're going to repay. That is God's responsibility. He's sitting on the throne. He's the judge. He's in charge. He's in control. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire in his head do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know how we are overcome by evil? We're overcome by evil when we let the flesh take control. When, when we want to show that we can win the argument, that we'll have the last laugh, that we're going to win at the end, we're overcome by evil. We may think we're doing the right thing, but we're fooled and blinded by the flesh. In Proverbs 24, 29, do not say, I will do to him just as he's done to me. I will render to a man according to his work. Don't say that. Don't speak about it. Don't talk about it. Don't boast about these things. The word of God is very clear. Do not say, I will do to him just as he's done to me. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15, another verse, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. In the hands of God, in the providence of God, you know what you learn? To leave the case in the hands of the Lord. Let him be the judge. Let him be the one that solves. Verse 29 of Genesis 42, let's look at it together. Then they went to Jacob, their father, after they had realized that their money had returned to their sack in the land of Canaan. And they told him all that had happened to them, saying, notice, they are speaking to their father regarding their trip to Egypt. The man who is Lord or who is in charge, the master of the land, spoke roughly to us. Why did Joseph do that? He was testing them. 
He spoke roughly to us. He was finding out what kind of character did these men have, the, the brothers that betrayed him. They spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, we are honest men. We're just, we're upright. We're not spies. They're retelling of what took place to their dad. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. This is the test here. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your household and be gone. That's what Joseph told them. You're going to have to leave one brother. You're going to buy food. You're going to bring the rest of your family and then, after you bring your youngest brother, you can buy more grain here for your household. So it continues in verse 34, And bring your youngest brother to me, so I know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men, and I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. He says, this is the only way that we can continue business. You bring your younger brother, I'll give you Simeon. And notice what's happening now. You'll also be able to sell and trade in this land. Verse 35, then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly, notice, they did not know what was taking place. Each man's bundle of money was in his sack, and when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. There's a word in there that really stands out in verse 35, surprisingly. Have you ever been surprised by God, his ways? The ways of God are mysterious. And they didn't understand what God was doing there. They didn't understand what their brother Joseph was doing. And each of them received their bag. They were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them. Now, I want you to realize something here that it refers to their father as Jacob. Would you circle that in your Bible? Jacob. God's already changed his name to Israel. Governed by God. He's no longer called or named Jacob anymore, that deceiver, that striver, that stubborn man. His name and nature has been changed. God called him to a new nature, but their scripture refers him as Jacob again. Why? Because in this point of his life, he was struggling with the old man. He was being stubborn. He, he was resisting. The old Jacob in him wanted to take control again. And notice what he does here. Instead of allowing these things to take place, instead of being open, notice what Jacob says. The stubborn flesh, the deceiver. He said to them, you have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin, the stubborn, self-centered, old man that is filled with the flesh. Notice what he proclaims and says, all these things are against me. You see, their son's response was, what is it that God has done to us? Now, Jacob in the flesh says this, all of these things are against me. Have you noticed that when you're going through suffering and your eyes are not on the Lord, you start to revolve everything around self? Maybe you start throwing a pity party. Why is everything happening bad to me? <laughs> Why is it always me? And that was there, Jacob struggling. He's looking at things from a human perspective. He doesn't understand that there was still a wise plan for God, for their life, for their family's life, even though he couldn't see it, even though he couldn't feel it. God was orchestrating these events to preserve that family, to take them to Egypt so that they can see Joseph. But he couldn't see it. So he says, all of these things are against me. Notice, when you think that all the things are against you, they're not against you. They're actually working for you now. And sometimes we can't see it. But we have to ask the Lord, Lord, let me see these things through spiritual eyes because things are so much better when I can see you working through them. Lord, show me how you're working through these circumstances. Oftentimes we think everything wrong is coming against me. Everything's falling apart, but we don't see God is working out his perfect plan. God has a master plan here. 
All we can see sometimes is adversity. All we can see sometimes is difficulty, is frustration, is hurt, is pain. But what are you going to choose to believe? Are you going to believe what your eyes can see? The things that are unfolding right before you? Are you going to believe those things? Or will you believe in what God has to say? In Romans 8, 28, we've read this several times as we look at the life of Joseph. And we know all things work together for what? For good. He's saying, why are all these things against me? But they're working out for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, God had a plan. And God was using this time to unfold that purpose, to unfold that plan, even in the life of Jacob and his sons. And it tells us there in Romans 8, 29, that God is using those things for the good. And what is the good? That we're conformed according to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the good. That is the purpose. That is the plan, that we become more like Jesus. Now, why is Jacob saying these things? Why are all these things happening to me? Why is it that I'm having to go through all this pain? Because he's believing the lie. What's the lie? He's believing the lie that he was told that Joseph is dead. He said, my son is dead. All these things are against me. He actually believes that when we believe the lies of the enemy, notice, instead of hearing God's truth, that lie has power over us. That's why we have to be very careful what we allow to come into our mind. You start to believe the lies, that lie is going to have power over you. That's why we should learn to cherish and to learn God's truth and only follow the truth of God, not be emotional about receiving the lies of the enemy? If you believe the lie of the enemy that God has forsaken you, that lie has power over you. Think about that. Or I'm beyond hope. That lie has power over you right now. Or God is done with me. He doesn't have a plan for my life anymore. Or you know what? I confess my sin, but I don't feel forgiven. Or I'm worthless in God's plan now. I've messed everything up. Where all of those things, notice, are the lies that the enemy wants to use to have power over us. And he's believing the lie there, Jacob. But in verse 37, something happens, and Reuben spoke to his father, saying, kill my two sons. And he's pleading now with his father. He's begging now. He's saying, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you, Benjamin. Put him in my hands. And I will bring him back to you. He says, you can put me responsible. You can kill my two sons. Uh, Put the shame on me. Put the guilt on me. Put the responsibility on me. I'll bring Benjamin back. But he said, my son shall not not go down with you. For his brother is dead. Notice, he really believed that Joseph was dead. And he was stubborn. He, He was hard at heart. He's not going to go. He's refusing to let Benjamin go. He says, and he is left alone. If if any calamity, speaking of Benjamin, should befall on him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. You want me to die in grief? It is, I don't don't care what happens. I'm protecting Benjamin because he's from my wife, Rachel, who he loved. He says, you're not going to take him. You've already taken my son, and Joseph is dead. You know, Joseph represents Christ in the Old Testament to us. It's amazing here because this is Joseph who he loved. This is the beloved son, Joseph, here to Jacob. But the the beloved son who he believed was dead is actually alive. (laughs) The beloved son was exalted to the highest place in Egypt. Who also was highly exalted? Jesus Christ. That living son who he thought was dead but is alive, notice what he is. He's the one that's giving all the bread. (laughs) Jesus himself, having risen and exalted, is the one that is the bread of life for us. That living son was the one that would be used to deliver and to save those in Egypt and in Canaan because he would give them of the bread of life. And there we see how Jesus himself is that living son that God has exalted to the highest place so that we can receive our salvation and not die of the famine that this world wants to put us through. 
Notice Genesis chapter 42. We see this continue here. And what do we learn here in Genesis 43? That God does not need perfect circumstances to accomplish his perfect plan. You may think right now, well, he needs a a perfect circumstance. He needs a perfect plan. He, He needs a perfect situation. That's not what God needs. God will work. God will use even an imperfect situation to accomplish his plan in your life. Remember that tonight. God God will use something that that you think in your eyes is not working out. It's suffering. It's painful. He will use that to accomplish the plan that he has for your life. And there in verse 1, notice a time of tension from verses 1 through 10 in the life of Joseph and his brothers. Now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to him, go back and buy us little food. Do you see this imperfect situation? The famine was severe. The, the famine was, was now costing them their food, their lives in the land of Canaan. But notice one thing there that you see in verse 43, verse 1 of chapter 43, that the famine, the trial would continue. And notice when it would continue until. It would continue until God accomplished his plan. The trial will continue until God has accomplished his plan in this family. Sometimes we say, Lord, is this famine, is this trial, is this test ever going to end? You know what God is saying? I'm going to allow this to continue until I finish my plan in your life through it. That's the providence of God there. That God has a purpose through it. That we as his people, we're not exempt from suffering. Notice, the famine was severe in the land, and the land where the nation of Israel, those tribes were dwelling in. We're not exempt from that suffering, but God will work through that suffering to accomplish his perfect plan in our lives. And in verse 2, it would say this, And it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain, which they had, bought, they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little bit of food. Isn't it interesting here in verse 2 that they had run out of resources, that they had run out of their own strength. They had nothing left within themselves of what they had brought. And maybe they thought, you know what? By the time that we finish this grain that we brought, the famine is going to be over. But when they came to the end of their strength, when they came to the end of their supply, when they they came to the end of their resources, and they had nowhere else to go, And you know what happens here? Their father says, go back and buy a little bit more food. We need more. We need more supply. But Judah, verse 3, spoke to them saying, the man solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Judah rises up. He responds. Do you not remember, father, the condition the man told us? You're not going to buy anything unless your brother comes to you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go by and down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. He reminds them. If you don't send Benjamin, then we're not going to be able to buy any food. You must send Benjamin. That's the only way. And notice here he's refusing initially. But God has a bigger plan, bigger than what Jacob could imagine. And I want you to think about today, God has a bigger plan, even in your circumstance, bigger than what you can imagine. Sometimes we think, well, why is this happening? Lord, why are you allowing this to take place? And it's only because he's lining up events. He's doing something in us because he's preparing the way for the next place that he has for us. And you think about it, if Joseph would have never been sold to Egypt, and if he had never gone to Potiphar's house, if he would have never been falsely accused If he had never been unjustly then sent to prison, he would never have interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker, then promoted again to second in command to be able to be used as governor over the entire land of Egypt to preserve the way so that his family from Canaan can come over and receive food and grain. None of those things would have happened if he first would not have been sold and put into that pit. Sometimes we don't understand why things are happening. But God is allowing them because he has a purpose. 
God is allowing them because he has a plan. And God is working through all of these events, even when we can't see them, to accomplish his perfect plan in our lives. Now notice verse 7, what takes place? But they said, the man asked us poignantly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told them according to these words, could we have possibly have not known that he would say, bring your brother down? But why does he say that? Could we have known that he would ask us, bring your brother down? Because in verse 6, notice what Israel does. He says, why did you deal so wrongfully with me? Well, why did you tell him? Why did you guys talk so much? This is all your fault. You told him you had another brother? You told him that you had a father? Why, why would you ever say that? And the only logical response there was, we didn't know that he would ask and want to meet him. How would we have known? So there, you see in verse 8, then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. First, it was Reuben that pleaded. Now Judah is pleading. Verse 8, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. Do you see how he's pleading with his father? Let us go or else we're going to die. You think, he's saying, you think that we're going to die? You think that Benjamin is going to die if you send him with us? He's probably going to die if he stays here <laughs> because we have no more food. Or we're going to die here of starvation. You're afraid of us dying in Egypt. If we stay, we're going to die here in Canaan as well if we don't go. So what does he do? He personally guarantees his safety. In verse 9, I myself will be surety for him from my hand. You shall require him. If I don't bring him back to you and send him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Let the sin be on me. Let me be responsible to bear that blame forever. Here, Judah is standing up and he's saying, you have to let him go or else we're going to die and put the responsibility, put the blame on me if he can't come back. So verse 10, for it was, for we had not lingered surely, by now we would have returned this second time. Notice what he says. You have us waiting. You have us delaying. You're procrastinating. You're thinking something's going to change. Nothing's going to change. We need to do something. If we would have gone already by this point, instead of waiting, we would have gone two times. You see, when God's people are going through some type of trial or test, we shouldn't just sit around and wait for God to do something. Sometimes we think, you know what? I'm not going to do nothing. I'm just going to wait for God to do something in this test or in this trial. We should also move into action and find relief. We shouldn't put off making a decision because we're stubborn. Sometimes we're putting off making a decision because we don't want to be open to seeing what God wants to do. Well, there he tells him, Judah tells his father, he says, notice, we would have already been back twice. And their father Israel, verse 11, said to them, if, I must, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels. Carry down a a present for the man. He says, we want to be in good terms now. So take food, take gifts, take those in your vessels, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio, nuts, and almonds. Think of everything that we can give. And now here, notice what we see in Israel. He, he's yielding now. He, he's willing now. He surrendered. This is Israel now. Israel now who is open to see what God wants to do. Go ahead, go and take. Go and take supplies, go and take a gift. Verse 12, take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. You know what, maybe it was a mistake. Take twice as much as money. Take all the gifts. Return over. Buy food, return the money. And verse 13, take your brother also, arise and go back to the man. He sends them on their way. And there in verse 14, it says, and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin if I'm bereaved 
I'm bereaved. <laughs> Notice the name of God that he uses there in verse 14. I want you to look at it. It's a very important name. We've seen it mentioned four times in the book of Genesis. And this is exactly here what Israel says. Now may the Lord Almighty, may God Almighty. What is this name that we know, this Hebrew covenant name that God has with the nation of Israel? El Shaddai. The God who has his hand on everything. I, I may not know what the outcome's going to be. Notice that even you right now and your situation, I may not know what the outcome will be, but El Shaddai, who has his hand on everything, I'll leave the results up to him. I trust in the Lord, the all-sufficient one, the one who knows all things. And he says this in verse 13, and may God Almighty, the all-sufficient one who has his hands on everything, may he give you mercy. That's the very thing that we need in the presence of God. What do we need? Mercy. Mercy is very unique. Mercy is, is what we should be praying for. And they did receive mercy. You know what mercy looks like? Mercy looks like not receiving what you actually deserve. We all receive mercy. I think sometimes we cry out for justice a lot, right? I want justice in my situation. This is not fair. I don't deserve this. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. You don't really want to get what you actually deserve. You know what mercy looks like? Mercy looks like not receiving what you actually deserve. And they did receive mercy. Not only did they receive mercy, they also received undeserved grace. You see how Joseph treated his brothers who mistreated him. He treated them with mercy and he treated them with grace. He didn't give them what they deserved. In fact, he gave them what they didn't deserve. He gave them a feast. He blessed them. He cared for them. And this is why in verse 14, what he says, may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your brother and Benjamin, and notice his response here. It is almost careless, one would think. He says, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. And if I lose my children, so be it. That's what he's saying. If he doesn't release Simeon, if he doesn't release Benjamin, then so be it. May God Almighty give you mercy, and I'll leave the rest up to God. <laughs> I think that that's the attitude that we need to have today. I'll leave the rest up to God. You know what this answer comes from? This answer is coming from a man who's remembering the nature of who God is. He's saying, I'm going to accept everything that comes from the hand of God. Today, can you say that? I'll leave that up to God. I'm going to pray for mercy. I'm going to ask for mercy. But when it comes to the results, I'll leave that up to God. I'll leave that in the hands of him who holds all things together. I'll accept everything that comes from the hand of God. You see, sometimes we do everything that's humanly possible. And that's exactly what Israel did. He waited it out as much as he could. He had purchased already, sent his sons for grain one time. He did everything he possibly could. You know what he had to do now? Simply trust the Lord to work things out according to his own will and plan. If you've done all the work yourself now as much as you possibly can and prayed for mercy, you know what we do? Lord, we leave the results up to you. We trust you with the outcome. You know what this name here of God reminds us of? God Almighty. Number one, that God is all-powerful. Remind yourself today of that. Maybe write it down in your notes. God is all-powerful. He is almighty. He is the God, El Shaddai. But the word there, mercy, you know what it also reminds us? That God is also all loving. This is how he deals with us. God deals with us with mercy. This is who we cry out to. Lord, give us mercy. And notice also what he says there in verse 14. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. This trust is in the Lord. Notice God is all present. He trusts God in the outcome. This is the doctrine of the transcendence of God, that he is everywhere and God is in everything. I trust God with whatever is next. 
Will you trust in the providence of God? Notice where you can say, I don't know what's next, but I trust God in whatever comes next. I don't have to strive. I don't have to be frustrated. I don't have to defend myself. El Sadai, the God who has his hands on everything, is in charge of what comes next. Now, his life was in the hands of God. And I want you to know this. Your life is also in the hands of God. And that's why tonight we can do the very same thing that Israel would have done and say this, may God give me mercy, God Almighty, El Shaddai, who has his hands on everything. Today, know this, God has his hands on your life. On every single moment, every situation, every circumstance, he's in control and he's in charge. And maybe it doesn't make sense what you're going through right now. Oftentimes it doesn't, but he's developing something in us that wouldn't otherwise take place unless he would put us in that place, in the position of testing. You know what our attitude should be? Lord, I don't want to be upset. I don't want to become angry. I don't want to be frustrated. Lord, speak for your servant is listening. What are you showing me, God? Maybe he's showing you that he's too prideful right now. Maybe you're showing, he's showing you you're too independent. Maybe he's showing you to trust him more. May he show you to draw near to God. Ask him right now in your situation, Lord, what are you showing me? Because you don't want to miss the lesson that God has for you in the trial. We want to pass the test. Amen? Let's all stand together.